Coaching Soccer Weekly, episode 348, The Red Herring Fallacy, entertaining, educational, and inspiring soccer content to help make you a more effective coach, player, or soccer parent. Hello and welcome back to Coaching Soccer Weekly, presented by World Class Coaching. My name is Sega Rabinovich, and this is the podcast devoted to bringing you cutting-edge methods, techniques, and tactics for coaching soccer. It doesn't matter if you're an experienced coach who has been training teams for many years or if you're new to coaching and working with a team for the very first time. There's something we can all do to take our coaching to the next level. Well, it was an interesting weekend. Um, As coaches, you could appreciate and you could probably hear it now that I lost my voice. I can coach this weekend. And for the first time in a long time that was one of the most frustrating experiences I've had as a coach and I'll tell you why it was frustrating let's start Saturday Saturday uh, 2013 Uh, we get to play we got to play this weekend against one of the only other 2013 teams I think there might have been three in the league I also asked the 2012s not to come this this week and for future games as well. So it's just essentially a 2013 team who are going to be playing up. Now, this is a pretty talented team. Um, but the frustrating part for me, and we'll get into this a little bit later, is we go out to games... And we're the better team very consistently, I would say. But we're just not winning. And it's starting to get frustrating when you're better and everyone can see it. But there's something missing. And that missing element is shooting. We got to start shooting the ball a lot more. And that's that was the talk that I had. But... As a new concept, it takes time to implement it in games and practices and stuff like that. So what I would have been doing the whole game was yelling shoot. And that goes against everything I stand for, 100%. Don't tell what the players don't tell the players what to do. However, we're starting to get a little bit like Manchester City were last year uh not this year and and you can see a huge difference this year and and here's why it seems like manchester city the past manchester city they wanted to walk the ball in the net and that's just not realistic you know unless you're way above the other team like two three levels above it's just not realistic to you know pass 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 all the way down and then a beautiful cutback to a completely open player who taps that's not realistic so our players have to learn to shoot now and that's what i wanted this game i wanted them to shoot the ball and and that's really what we focused on and there were opportunities where that would happen but it wasn't enough and the one time our player was open in our half took an absolute rocket and hit a top corner we ended up tying the game 1-1 but I was upset because of the opportunities that just went by where we had the opportunity but we just wanted to make it easier and to be brave as our players are and not shoot the ball was very irritating And that was frustrating for me, not being able to help them. Um, Everything else was fine. We played well. Uh, The other team was pretty good, you know. Uh, But that was frustrating. Going into this weekend, I'm going to try and really focus on that shooting. But I can't physically yell shoot. I just physically can't do it. 
um, it doesn't make sense. So what will start happening um, and what I want from my players this weekend is when they receive it, I'm going to yell, find a way to shoot. That is not me telling them when to shoot. So they're still making their own decision. But when we get close enough, find a way to shoot. Find a way to hit the target. And I don't think... Sorry, let me say that again. There's something wrong with that. I'll admit it right now. Um, I'm making a decision for my players. But it's a little bit better than telling them when to do it. So uh, we, we have to start scoring goals. Like, it, it's not okay. It's not okay to be a better team and not win. It, it, it's okay to be the worst team. That's there's. I'm okay with that. But if we're consistently the better team and the scoreboard isn't showing it, it's just not okay with me anymore. Um, and that's a frustration. You know, the parents get it. And I'll talk about this a little bit later on as well. But they get it. You know, they see the development. They see their players getting better. Um, but this is a pride thing for me now. We've done so well. We're feared. People hate playing against us. And I love that. I love it. They know they're going to be up for a fight. But at the end of the day, if we're still not competitive on the scoreboard, you can fight all day. But if you're fighting a losing battle, what's the point? So that's going to change. And that's going to change this weekend. So that's part one of the frustration. Part two was a 2014 game. So let's let's talk about and sorry I'm just kind of uh, taking my tea so I can keep talking throughout I put my team in division 3 and the reason I put my team in division 3 wasn't because they weren't good enough to play division 2 from a 1v1 point of view the other teams aren't even close um, I have so much confidence in our players but the shape, the formation, the tactics were, were not close to the other teams. Um, and by other teams, I mean our other teams, not the teams that we're playing against. So I put us in Division Three, so we could work on our shape. We could work on our formation. Players can play different positions, understand where they are, and not really have to worry about the score. So when you go into a game like that with that being the goal and as a coach you can't help your team because most of the time when I'm coaching I'm coaching the players off the ball so we don't have to worry about 1v1s in this league we don't have to worry about my players doing moves they're all doing it what we do have to worry about is the positioning but I can't yell I can't talk so we won the game 7-6-0, but I was so frustrated because I went in wanting something out of this game and I didn't get it. Uh, I wasn't able to make my players better. And that's what I use the game for. The game is a test. I always say that. In school, you have a lesson plan and then you test out if you've learned the material by doing a test. The game is the test. And we're just not there yet. And I can't help. I can't help my players. And that's the most frustrating thing. I want to go into the test being able to help them. And I know in the test it should be you by yourself, but soccer is different than school. You know, you're with seven other players, nine other players, 11 other players. You should be able to help each other. And I should be able to help my players. And the fact that I couldn't, I, I was fuming. I was so upset at halftime. And we were up four or five zero. I was so upset because my defenders, one of them was going up in the center mid position. My center mid was going up in the forward position. My forward was um, in the center mid. Like, 
it just wasn't i had a winger go to the other side of the field like it, it it's not okay and i can't do anything about it so it was a very frustrating weekend to not be able to talk that was it um yeah so that's just that's where i'm at there's no solution there's no you know there's none of that <laughs> i couldn't talk there was no one there to talk um that was it my other coach was away this weekend he left the country so nothing um and and you have those moments as a coach there are teams and i do this later on in the season where i try not to talk in the games that's different halfway through the season we should be at that point and i'm going to go back to the 2014s halfway through the season and i should be able not to talk but at the beginning of the season we're working on stuff right we're, we're working and working and working the 2010s under 13s that's the one where i can sit back not talk fair enough but under nines under tens yeah so very frustrating weekend from that point of view um and, and this is this is really interesting because we destroyed a team 7-0 and i was upset for me the win doesn't matter and, and i really realize that it doesn't matter unless we win the right way um so yeah th that's that's where i'm at i wish i had you know a solution but a lot of the times we just got to reflect and move on now i'm so excited having said all that <laughs> let's shift gears and be excited i got my vo2 and it's going to make a huge difference i know it will the quality that vo has stepped it up amazing i'm so excited um i'm going to be talking about this a lot I'm going to be talking about it next game moving forward because I'm really excited for the update. Um, if you're looking for a VO2, $200 off. It's worth it. That's it. It's worth it. I talk about it every week. Um, $200 off is a lot of money. If you want a VO, um, we have our link in the uh, show notes. Uh, if you can't find it, send me an email. Let me know and I will send you the link for free go vo thanks for sponsoring the show one of my favorite things about hosting the show is the emails that i get and i, I really want you to benefit from that last week i spoke about starting a facebook group and i did that um and we're already up to 20 members which is incredible um, there's a lot of you. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. And, and there's even more of you with unique, amazing coaching experiences. And I know a lot of you want to help. I know a lot of you would love to give advice. And I think that's amazing. And that's why I decided to do this, to have the Facebook group. Um, so this week, I decided to share that. <laughs> um, I'm going to share uh, something that a coach wrote on the board. And uh, if you want to give him advice, just come on. It, just join it. Join it. Worst comes to worst, you join it. And you just see it every once in a while. That's it. Uh, best situation is you learn something, you know, and, and I think we all learn something. And I'm going to start doing threads and asking questions and things like that to try and get your perspective on things. Because I think that's important. Uh, I think you're important. So um, I'm going to do my best here uh, to read this. I never read from a script. Uh, I'm not that kind of host. I did when I first started, fun fact. That didn't go well. <laughs> so thanks for sticking with me but um so this is the first time that you're really going to hear me read um yeah so let's start 
So this coach, uh, I'll kind of summarize the first couple of paragraphs and then I'll read the last one. Uh, he's essentially from Philadelphia. Um, he's training 2012s. And uh, sorry, taking a sip of my tea here. Um, he's training 2012s. He's training the top team of the 2012s. They've got five 2012 teams, which is amazing. Um, they have, uh, let me see here. Oh, so, so the training situation that he has is something that I do as well. Sometimes the A team trains with the B team. Um, you know, so he's, he mixes the players a lot, which I think is great. He really focuses on long-term development um, with the players. Um, and he plays against some really good teams. So he's in the top division, plays against uh, two MLS Next Academy teams, Um one of them is the Union, Philadelphia Union. The other one I don't know how to pronounce, FC Delco, something like that. That makes sense. <laughs> so some premier clubs. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm going to read the last part of everything and then kind of give my two cents about it um, and go from there. All right, let's go. In the Philadelphia market, there are very, very good teams that we compete with. Some are better, some are not. And we have two MLS Next Academy teams, the Union, FC Delco that I mentioned. That being said, you can see we have a development mindset with our 2012s. We play at the top rackets in regional leagues and tournaments. Because of the pressure from other teams playing a more performance-based program, parents will look at wins and some of the things that we're all familiar with that are not indicators of long-term success but are quite fun and say, hey, I don't want to lose games because my coach continues to play out of the back more. Training with the B team um, is trying to teach concepts during games as opposed to trying to win games. Sorry, my phone is going crazy. <laughs> so I struggle with some of the information that you provide on the podcast, not because it's wrong information, but because it hits a nerve for me as I finally believe in what you're saying, but I'm torn between having to retain players who are quite talented, who will not stay if we do not win more games than we lose. So to speak and doing the right long-term development plan for the age group, I'm serving a lot of masters. I'd love to hear some feedback. Um, and he talks a little bit about his coaching experience. So I'm going to break this down a little bit. Um, I'm going to start with this. Because of the pressure from other teams playing a more performance-based program, parents will look at wins and some of the things that we're all familiar with that are not indicators of long-term success. This past week, um, I had a 2014 player leave us. He's a player that has been with us since he was four years old. Five years, I would argue he's one of the best players in the province by now uh and, and and really all he has as his soccer development has been us the mom and i spoke and what's interesting is that his brother's staying with us who's younger um but essentially she moved to a different club and this is exactly what happened. You know, these things that are not really long-term success and, and help players that the other club that she is going to, um, that's really what motivated her to go. And that brings me to what I wanted to talk about today, the red herring fallacy. The red herring fallacy um, talks about, it, it's an old idea. And long ago, essentially, um, they would send dogs after uh, foxes, right? So hunting dogs. So for example, um, back when you, know, you had a herd of cattle and a fox would come in, and slaughter them uh, they would send the dog after it but they had to train the dog to follow the fox so here's what they would do they would start out with 
uh, a fox and they would let him go so that the dog would follow the scent of the fox. Having the fox be the primary goal of the dog. Go hunt the fox. Now, just like the dog would, when they're going after the fox and it's a big forest, they're going to have some distractions. So what they would do to prepare the dog is they would take a bunch of smelly fish, the red herring, and they would just kind of help and, and drag it in the same line as the fox to try and see if this would divert the dog from the fox. And this is how they would train the dog to follow one scent, right? Follow the fox by giving it all these different diverging smells that they would still have to kind of tune them out and focus on what's important, the fox. These other clubs, and from what it sounds like, this is what he is describing, is they're the red herring. They're talking to parents, and their selling points are beautiful turf field, beautiful facility. You know, we've got coaches that are UEFA a licensed all these things that have nothing to do with the goal right the fox which is player development I don't talk about coaching I don't talk about our facility when I talk to parents I talk about what the plan is the plan is player development we start with one of ones we work on making sure that your son or daughter understands what to do when they have the ball. And then once they get good enough, then we talk about what to do without the ball. Our whole focus is soccer. When you take that away and you start to focus on the other things, that's the red herring. And to me, if your club is focusing on the red herring, you might be successful now, but I guarantee in four or five years we will be more successful because we're the ones focusing on the primary goal, the fox, killing the fox, right? We want to develop individual players. I could care less what facility I have. You know, don't get me wrong. Having a brilliant facility, that's great. But if your brilliant facility doesn't match your development structure then there's why are you bringing it up what's the point of it right it's a beautiful flower but if the flower you know smells bad and is poisonous what's the like why are you going to it it, it doesn't make any sense so for me when I hear this that's okay however the missing piece I think is parent education and that is the most important piece for me it doesn't matter if we talk about player development on the show until you know our face is blue if the parents don't know that you're doing it if the parents can't see the difference between you and someone else then it, it, it's not going to do anything. So my advice will be to focus on the parent education part of it. And I'll give you an example. So we use VO to record our games, and I think that's obvious by now. But what's been really cool about VO is that we've used it at parent meeting to show what we do compared to the team that we play against. So I'll show them a game and I'll show the other team and how they score. That all they're doing the whole game is goalkeeper gets the ball, they kick it up, one other player gets a touch on it, 
and sometimes he scores, sometimes he doesn't. When we're playing 7v7, that's 2 out of 15 players, or 2 out of 14, maybe 13 players, right? Because you got 7 on there, maybe 6 on the bench, 5 on the bench even. Sometimes, uh, yeah, 6 I would say is the most, so maybe 13 players. But if you're a parent, and 2 out of 14 or 13 players are touching the ball, what are the chances that's your son or daughter? Probably not that big. So we show them that, and then we show them our goals. Never, never has our goal ever been two players touching the ball. It's always been four, five players, you know? And that's so powerful that we can tell you their parents, your son or daughter is going to be a part of this no matter what. So it's parent education that's really important. And I think having a meeting before every season is really what's going to bring the parents on your side. Now, there's a couple of other things that I want to get to in this as well. And I spoke about this before. I can really understand where he's coming from. Because as I mentioned, a lot of this stuff doesn't necessarily apply to you that I talk about. I understand that I'm in a very unique position. I get it. You know, I'm the owner of a club. And I make the decisions. And I made a decision a long time ago that I'm only going to work with players and parents who want to work with me. I'm really not going to force it. So if a parent doesn't want to be with us, they're free to leave. Most people, when they hear about my business plan, they laugh. Um, because it shouldn't work. My business plan is this. Uh, uh, very unique. I don't think anyone else does this. It's a monthly program. It's a gym membership, essentially. You can leave any time. I need 30 days notice, and you can go. Not a problem. So when people hear this, they ask, how do you still have players? Because I educate the parents. That's the most important part. The parents believe in what we do. The second they don't, they're free to leave. Because I don't want resentment on my field. I don't want it in my program. We're very specific to player development. Like very, very specific. That's all I care about. Proof? I was furious on Sunday when we won 7-0. Furious. Because we didn't play the right way. I could care less if we win. It doesn't matter to me. We gotta play our way. We do. So, I'm probably not the best person to answer this question. If I'm being honest, you know, so I know you're out there. I know you can help. So come join our fun Facebook group. Start conversations. This is how people get better. This is how knowledge is spread. And, and that's it. Come help out. You know, you're awesome. You're knowledgeable. I think it would be great. Join me. <laughs> Um, Coaching Soccer Weekly on Facebook. Come find it. I think one of the um, primary reasons I felt comfortable taking over the show from Tom was because I listened to every single episode. So I was, I started, I would say, um, like a year later. But before, once I heard his first show, I restarted and listened to every episode. So I've listened to everything Tom had to say. So I really feel like when I'm talking, I can go back and really uh, think about a lot of the stuff that he said. And that has a big value in how I approach my coaching. That's not to say I, I can't speak for Tom or anything like that, but he has definitely had a huge influence on me and continues to, by the way. So uh, I, I got this question from another coach about shootouts. And I'm going to start it off with Tom. 
and what I remember hearing on the show when he spoke about his teams going through it. And then I'll talk about me. So I remember one of my favorite things that he said was that what he would say in front of everyone just to kind of give the goalkeeper confidence was that um, if the goalkeeper, if, if you, he would look at the goalkeeper and talk to him, if you stop one, that's amazing, right? If you stop two, that's unbelievable. Anything more than that, absolutely incredible. It, it, and the idea for me when I talk to my players about shootouts is to take away the pressure. I think that's the most important part of this. Taking a penalty kick is the only time, the only time in the game where you are by yourself. You don't have teammates. No one can help you. It's just you. So the most amount of pressure you are going to feel is there. The ball is stopped. You can't react. You can talk about 90th minute you know, goals and things like that in games. But at the end of the day, you're still reacting to a ball coming at you during the game. So if your body is naturally has gone through the motions thousands of times <coughs> then it shouldn't be tough so penalty shootouts they're the only time you're by yourself so as a coach what I look at how can I take away the pressure and here's how I do that with the players I'm going to take away all the decisions that's what I'm going to do because that's the toughest part you don't want to be up there feeling the pressure and then making a decision. So here's what I'll say. I'll say, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to pick a direction right now. I'll say this to all the players. Pick a direction. That's where you're going to pass the ball. I'm not going to use the word shoot, pass the ball. And here's the reason I say that. <sighs> now, the goalkeeper has to make a save. If you miss the net, you're making the job easier on the goalkeeper. So here's what the goalkeeper has to do. The goalkeeper, one, has to guess the correct way. And there's infinite ways you can go. Middle, in between the goalposts and the middle. Like There, there are so many different directions. Yes, you can go right, left, or middle. I get that. But there's so many different angles you can shoot. So he has to guess right. Then he has to make a save. And then he has to make sure that the save doesn't go in. That's very hard. So you already have an advantage. So all you have to do is pick a direction. Pass the ball into the corner. Obviously hard. And that's it. That's what I tell my players. If you pick a direction right now. Go in. And that's it. That way they're not, as they're going up, they're not thinking, oh, my first teammate went left, then the second guy went right, so now should I go left? Because the goalkeeper might be expecting right, or should I, maybe the goalkeeper, you know? Like, there's so many decisions there. Let's take that away. Let's take away the pressure. Now, my players going up are saying, I'm going right. I know I'm going right. So all I have to focus on is a hard pass. The goalkeeper makes a stop. Great. Go for it. Fantastic. Now, I do have to be honest here. Um, when it comes to penalty kicks, my players have no experience. Um, maybe the odd penalty shot here and there, but we don't, because of Ontario soccer's rules and the fact that there's no points, standings, tournaments that end up in playoffs and things like that, we don't have any experiences with it because we're never in situations where that's even possible. So at least up until U13, and this is our first year going into U13. So it could happen this year, but with the younger ones who I've been coaching since I started the show, it just hasn't happened. Thanks for listening to another episode of Coaching Soccer Weekly. This was a really rough weekend for me. 
and hopefully my voice will be back to normal by Saturday. It's Thursday today, so I'm really going to try and rest up and not talk as much, um, which uh, is tough, but we'll see how that goes, and I'll definitely keep you posted. This weekend, our two oldest teams are playing, our 2010 team, and then our other team, which is our 2011-2012 team, uh, is playing in 9v9. So I'll keep you posted on how that goes. Uh, Please join me on Facebook with uh, Coaching Soccer Weekly. Just put it in the search bar. It'll come up. You can ask to join, and I'll let you in. Easy as that. Uh, It'll be a really great networking place, I think, and just a great way to talk to other coaches. So hopefully I see you there. And until next week, enjoy the journey. Enjoy the moments, but most importantly, enjoy the game. Coaching Soccer Weekly is a production. Hey, thanks for watching all the way to the end. And you can check out more of our videos right here. And if you haven't done so already, I would really appreciate it if you'd hit the like button and the subscribe button.